Hello again and welcome. This is this segment is entitled Metabolic Regulation. This is a fairly short segment in which we're going to uh, tie a number of different threads together and then introduce you also to some new concepts that you may not be familiar with that will be useful in the short term in terms of understanding some regulatory processes but also be useful going forward. So let's begin with the sort of elementary things. This is pulling together some threads that we've mentioned here and there in, uh, uh, in a, uh, separately as we've gone through metabolism. But let's come back and pull them together and try to get a sense of the big picture of how this works. So this uh, rather complicated diagram shows you selective steps in the entire oxidation of glucose all the way through to CO2. Remember that, that the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle shown at the bottom is in fact going to turn incoming uh, pyruvate ultimately into uh, the, the acetate units rather derived from pyruvate into uh, carbon dioxide and PDH will in fact take off the first of those three carbons from pyruvate as CO2 and the other two carbons in the acetate unit will ultimately be released as CO2 in multiple uh, turns around the, the TCA or uh, citric acid cycle as, as we've discussed. So what I want to do though is focus in, this diagram is slightly complicated until you walk through it and understand what it's telling you, and as we walk through it it'll give us a chance to reinforce key concepts, key principles, and also give you the sense of the big picture as I alluded to a moment ago. Let's really be clear about why uh, it's so important to regulate metabolism. So uh, remember that uh, uh, biochemistry is not magic, it doesn't change the rules of chemistry. So in fact if you want to control what chemistry actually goes on in the cell, you can accelerate reactions dramatically by enzymatic catalysis as we we've talked about at great length. But what's the other thing you have to do? You have to make sure that when you don't want molecules to react, they're in a form where they're not going to react. So in fact, organisms are designed to store uh, reduced hydrocarbons, reducing potential, in several key forms that we'll talk about later. Glucose tends to be stored in things like glycogen, which we've talked about in general in, in the context of uh, uh, carbohydrate structure, but that we're going to talk about more specifically later in, in, in physiological terms. So there, it's, it's stored there in a molecule that's, that's quite stable and is, is uh, pretty well protected from undergoing uh, undesirable uh, biochemical reactions, or it can be stored in as fatty acids in lipids, for example, something else that we've touched on and we'll talk again more about uh, in more detail later. But if you then take the, that reducing potential out of glycogen into glucose and start it down to in, through glycolysis in the TCA cycle, or if you do the same thing with redu reducing potential from fatty acids in ways that we'll talk about in the future, you've now, you're now causing this reducing potential to pass through intermediates that are much more reactive than either fats or uh, glycogen, uh, for example. So you then uh, run the risk of, of all kinds of undesirable side reactions if you're not using that material at, at the end to produce ATP and uh, ultimately s turning it into CO2 and water. So it's very important that you um, start molecules down uh, metabolic pathways only when you actually want them. And so it, it, uh, intermediary metabolism in particular with a enormous amounts of flux through this pathway, it's very important to control the carbon is there to make sure that carbon shows up there only when you're actually going to turn around and use it all the way through the pathway. So each of these um, regulatory processes that we'll talk about in the next few minutes has that goal, has the goal of, of making sure that carbon enters the, the pathway only when you're going to run it the rest of the way through to good purpose, to specific purpose. All right, let's start with the first step in glycolysis. This is hexokinase. It's activated by free phosphate. Does that make sense? It does. There's not a lot of free phosphate in biological systems other than the phosphate that is hydrolyzed, released by the, hy the ex uh, exergonic hydrolysis of ATP in the course of doing things like muscle contraction or uh, any other en energy requiring process that we've talked at great length about earlier. ATP is very often, not always, but very often the currency that's used to couple an exergonic reaction like uh, ATP hydrolysis with an desirable but, but desirable but endergonic biochemical reaction like muscle contraction or the biosynthesis of one molecule or another from small precursors and so on and so forth. So in, in general free phosphate uh, particularly in the context of the cytosol where glycolysis is occurring here or in the case of the mitochondrion where the TCA cycle is going on is usually a signal uh, that it's time to make more ATP that's the point. So this makes actually great sense. It's also inhibited by its own product G6P. 
that's interesting as well. This is this is called a product. It's negative product feedback. So that if you're overproducing the product, you stop. You don't make any more. And again, it makes sort of very elementary sense. Um, but it's it's crucial here to appreciate that at glucose and particularly glucose 6-phosphate, glucose can be shunted off in other directions. It can go into a pentose phosphate pathway that we'll talk a lot about later. It can go into glycogen synthesis, that is building up the glycogen storage molecule in which glucose is, is stored when you don't want to use it, uh, uh, that we talked about a, a moment ago. And so uh, uh, you're, you're, um, you're still at the point where you've got a lot of decision capabilities. So you're just controlling uh, uh, hexokinase to respond to ADP depletion and to respond to overproduction of its own product. If it's, if it's making product that nobody else apparently has a demand for at the moment, don't make any more. Stop it. So it, that's quite elementary. The next step is, is a lot more interesting. This is phosphofructokinase. As we talked about earlier, this is the commitment step in glycolysis. So we mentioned a moment ago that glucose and glucose 6-phosphate can go off in other directions. It can go down the glycolytic pathway that's diagrammed on the on the screen that you can see here on on your screen, uh, but the uh, it can also uh, in addition to going into glycolysis it can go into these other pathways. So when you uh, when you on the other hand when you phosphorylate fructose 6-phosphate to make 1,6 bisphosphate, fructose bisphosphate, now you're, now you're committed. This thing is running down the uh, glycolytic pathway. It has no other place to go. So in fact, if you run it in this first pathway and you don't have a place to put it later, if you're not using it immediately for something, that's undesirable. You're going to have uh, potentially reactive uh, products sitting around with nowhere to go, therefore the creating the potential for undesirable side reactions, potentially producing toxic or at least undesirable and wasteful products. So phosphofructokinase is extremely intensively controlled, much more so even than, than hexokinase. So phosphofructokinase and hexokinase, you recall, are the two uh, um, exergonic steps. That is, they're made with hydrolysis of ATP so that the net uh, free energy drop is substantial, so the, the reaction tends to drive itself forward. So those are the two obvious steps for control hexokinase and phosphofructokinase, but phosphofructokinase is the especially desirable one because that's the point at which you have, there's no going back. You're, you've run stuff, you've pushed the snowball over the hill and it's going to roll down the hill to completion. So let's look at phosphofructokinase. There's some interesting stories here. So notice that it, uh, that it is uh, feed forward regulated, that is its substrate stimulates it, and in fact its product, fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, also stimulates it. Kind of odd. In other words, if, if there's more, uh, if there's a lot of substrate, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of, yes, a lot of substrate, run it quickly. But if there's a lot of product, keep going too. So that, at first glance, that seems a little odd. But it's the other regular interaction with the other regulatory event, uh, 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 allosteric modifiers, particularly AMP and ATP, that are most important. I didn't mention at the beginning, but I presume it's obvious to you. All of these are what we've talked about at length earlier as allosteric modifiers. They bind not in general at the active side of the enzyme. They bind elsewhere, uh, uh, driving uh, structural uh, uh, changes, subtle structural changes, which modulate the enzymatic activity of the active site itself. So these are uh, essentially, without exception, these are uh, uh, allosteric regulators of that form. So Inorganic phosphate drives the reaction forward. That makes sense in the same for the same reason that it did for hexokinase a moment ago. AMP also tends to drive this reaction forward. AMP is the extreme degradation product of ATP. It means that you've spent both of the phosphate anhydrides on the molecule. Uh, and as we've talked about a couple of cases earlier, uh, that's sometimes done when you really want a lot of energy to drive a, uh, a particular reaction in the forward direction. You burn both phosphates. Uh, ammonium ion is also uh, uh, accelerates this reaction. That's uh, 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 connecting uh, this reaction to other things, probably in particular the degradation of amino acids, um, a, a more complex story that's, that we don't need to consider uh, too much here. And then finally, uh, two other cases. So ATP is a in strong inhibitor, a powerful allosteric inhibitor of fructose uh, of the of phosphofructokinase. Makes perfect sense again. So you're stimulated by AMP and you're uh, inhibited by ATP. In other words, you're responding to the energy charge, whether there's, uh, there's enough uh, ATP. Mm -hmm.